Welcome, welcome, welcome to the Ark of Des Moines, the Ark Church, the Ark at Franklin. We could all take a seat or wherever you're going to be. You're so spread out. <laughs> I ain't doing it. Uh, we're going to go after a stronghold this morning. Uh, definitely. This is, uh, gosh, I, I, if we take a zoom out and look, uh, in, in this area that we're diving in today, uh, we're going to see where the enemy has been wreaking havoc uh, in the church, in families, uh, mother, uh, wives and husbands, uh, mothers and daughters, right? It, it's a word on unity. It's a word on harmony. Uh, it's a word on oneness uh, in the body of Christ. So uh, let's dive right in. I'm going to pray us in, and, and we're going to dive into the word of God. And so, uh, Father, we thank you. Uh, God, for your holy presence this morning. Father, I thank you, God, Lord, that tangibly I can just sense your presence, God, that you, God, it pleases your heart, uh, Father, for a people that would love to partner with you in the fulfillment of this word, of this word, Lord Jesus. So, Father, we just say yes to you, God. Father, we partner, God, with your will and with your plan for our lives and for the body of Christ. God, we say yes Yes, yes, Lord. Father, we know it's going to take labor. Father, we know it's going to take tears. God, but we partner and we say yes to you. God, we bless you today. In the mighty name of Jesus. Um, I'm going to start in Ephesians chapter 2. It's the, it's the same section of scripture that Lee was in last week. Uh, he touched on different parts of it, but we're going to dive a little bit deeper into uh, so, some prophetic insight I was seeing in uh, this section right here. So, okay, starting in verse 13. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in the place of two, so making peace and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, therefore killing the hostility. So what, what he's talking about in this section of scripture, it's there was a dividing wall and I think John uh, dove into it a little bit, but what he's talking about is the, it's, it's the covenant that was given to the Jewish people, but it wasn't given to the Gentiles at that time or the non-Jews. So what he's speaking of, it's the, it's the cultural divide between Jew and Gentile, right? And it says that through, through the body and the blood and the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, when he came, he actually, we can see in Acts 2 when he sends uh, someone to the house of, I think it's Cornelius, right, who was a Gentile, and he received the Holy Spirit, and then they had the revelation like, oh wow, this, this promise is for the Gentiles also, right? It's not just for the children of Israel, right? It came first to the children of Israel, but when Jesus came, he made two, man, two men into one, right? Into one. But I, I want to touch on something. The Lord was showing me prophetically that that cultural divide that was between Jew and and Gentile back in the day 2,000 years ago is the same cultural divide that we see in denominations in today's Christian church. In today's Christian church, right, we have, we have erected for ourselves these walls and we've actually begun to pit ourselves against one another. Right, and we can see it with the Reformed Church against the, the Pentecostals, the Methodist, Lutheran. I, I did some digging, there's 50 58,000 Christian denominations, 58,000. That's, and it pinged on me this morning. I'm like, Lord, how many verses are in your Bible? There's t roughly 23,000 verses in the Bible. There are, more than, <laughs> there are more than double the amount of denominations in the Christian church than there are verses in the Bible. How can we even find that much stuff to divide over? Right, I, I, I don't understand how we got here, right? But there is, what, what the Lord's saying in this, in this section of scripture is in, in, in his sacrifice, right? In the perfect sacrifice of the lamb, he's able to unite, right? So many separate things and bring it into a unification, right? It's why he came, but, but we've, we've actually, we've stepped into a place 
in the church where if someone doesn't have the exact same interpretation of the scriptures that we have, we're automatically against that person. We're automatically against him, right? If, if, if you listen to a sermon and you don't agree 100% with every single thing that that person preached, now he's a false teacher. He's a false prophet. He's a heretic, right? If, you, if, if you're on YouTube, if you uh, watch sermons uh, online or anything like that, it is plagued with division. It is plagued with division, right? And gosh, it, it, it pains my heart to see it. It pains my heart to see it because what is, what is the, the unbeliever supposed to think, right? Lee touched on it last week. I mean, if we're not any different than the outside world, what is attractive about what we have? What is attractive about what we have? You know what I'm saying? And it, it, the, the enemy has, he's put his grips inside the church, right? And ultimately that's why we see culture being the way it is. You know what I'm saying? We don't, we don't see unity in marriages. We don't see unity in the church. We can't partner uh, with the advancement of the gospel, right? And we've, we've found ourselves picking each other apart and we've stepped, it's friendly fire, honestly. It, it, it is friendly fire. And I feel like it's, it's, there's so many paths to go down, right? And I, I'm just trusting in the Lord to articulate and speak to what he wants to speak to. But there's a, there's a right way and a wrong way to enter into a discussion about different interpretations of what we read in the scriptures. There's a right and a wrong way to do it, right? And I believe for, for a long time that we have been we have been dancing around the right way to do it and we've actually pit ourselves continually, continually against one another, right? So, gosh, Lord, give me, give me insight. Father, lead me in Jesus' name. Come on, in Jesus' name. There's, there's so much. Come on, I, I, I spoke the word earlier about clarity in the mind. I can feel the enemy trying to, trying to stop the word. You know what I'm saying? Trying to, trying to plug it up, trying to block it, right? So there's, there's hostility there's hostility in the church, right? And it says through his cross, he came and he broke that thing down, right? It's the, it's the same sacrifice that we have to make to be able to see unity in the church, right? Jesus' Jesus's price, it, it, it was enough to bring us together, but we have to step into that and, and pay that same price. That's why we see it, right? That's why we're not connected. That's why we're not unified and on the same front, right? We've stopped making, about, making it about the gospel of Jesus Christ and we've moved into, uh, if your interpretation isn't good, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna stand by you, right? We, we get caught up on, you know, do you believe in the gifts of the Holy Spirit? Do you not? Do you believe in post-trib rapture or do you not? You know what I'm saying? Are you post-trib? Are you pre-trib? And, and something, gosh, and I've had to check my own heart in this. You know what I'm saying? I've, I've found myself, right, with this righteous frustration welling up in me when I, when I talk to somebody that, say, uh, like a Calvinist or something, that doesn't believe a lot of the, the Pentecostal uh, charismatic uh, viewpoints of the scriptures, even though it's in there. And, and I, I just, I feel like, gosh, I feel like there's a struggle to be able to relate and to be on the same playing field. But this man sitting across from me, he believes that Jesus came. He believes that Jesus died, right? Was buried for three days. On the third day, he rose and that he's resurrected and seated at the right hand of power. That is the qualification right to become a believer. It says, confess with your tongue that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and you will be saved. We see in 1 Corinthians 15, when Paul speaks about the gospel that he presented to the Corinthians, it was that. It was Jesus came, Jesus died, Jesus rose in accordance with the scriptures. And this is the thing, it's the thing that uh, Lee was talking about this morning. They were together in one place and then he goes into this message of you killed him in, in accordance with the scriptures, right? But they were together in one place, right? And we see this mighty outpouring and I believe that that is why we see such, uh, such a violent attack on the unity in the body of Christ. It's because we see a mighty outpouring such as Acts 2 
uh, the enemy sees that and says, okay, what caused that? And what, how can I stick my claws into the midst of that and to be able to un- and unravel it? You know what I'm saying? So, so now we have 2,000 years later, all these denominations, everybody thinks differently about everything, but how did we get here? And how do we, how do we move forward ultimately? How do we move forward, right? Because I, I believe that there are, there are certain things that we must unify on and there's certain things that we need to just agree to disagree on, right? I love, I love Dr. Michael Brown, right? He's a, he's a theologian. He's got a PhD. He's a charismatic. And he has debates with some, some, uh, some theologians, Calvinistic, right, that have differing views, right? And, and both their, uh, the, the presentation of their viewpoints are, they're all scriptural, like, hey, this is what I'm interpreting in the scriptures. But after they have such a debate about a topic, these guys minister together. They minister together. So you're telling me that it's possible. It's possible to disagree on viewpoints or interpretations of the scriptures and still release the word of God. I'm saying it is possible. And I'm saying that we must fight for the unity in the body of Christ, right? And there's, gosh, I'm not sure where it's at. I think it's, I'm not sure if I have this scripture, but it's uh, Matthew, Matthew 12, I believe. Let me get there. What'd you say? I might, yeah. No, let's go to Matthew 18 first. So we see in Matthew 18, right, there's, there's a brother sinning against you. And I, I don't think I'm going to get into that too much. Um, that's a rabbit hole all in, of, in and of itself. But this is, this is what the enemy is attacking. It's, it's Matthew 18, 18 and 19. It says, truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth, it shall be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth, it shall be loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you, if you, if two of you agree on any, on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father who is in heaven, right? What we see in that scripture is agreement with your brother, right? Coming, coming into the same accord, the same mind, and moving forward, right? Not, not necessarily agreeing on every, everything, but on certain matters, right, we're united. And that's what I'm saying. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's the goodness of God. It's the blood of Jesus, right? And, and the, the Lord was showing me, I think it's in Romans 14, 17. I do believe I have that, Tina. It says, the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, of joy, and of peace in the Holy Spirit. Of righteousness, Joy, I, uh, Romans 14. Okay. Righteousness, joy, and peace in the Holy Spirit. Whoever thus serves Christ is acceptable to God and approved by men. So then let us pursue what makes for peace and for mutual upbuilding. That, that word peace is, it's like Yirene or something, Irene. It, it's, it's the word for harmony right? We're called to actually come. It's, it's hard to do. It's not an easy thing to do with so many different personalities and characteristics in this. I mean, even in the, the 30, 40 people that are in here, it is tough to come into a body of people and to harmonize fully with one another. It's, it's a tough thing that you got to do, but you have to fight for it. How many husbands and wives agree on everything or have the same interpretation or outlook on everything? You know what I'm saying? Like that is, it's something, it's something that you have to strive for, right? It says in uh, Hebrews, I believe it's chapter 12. It says, strive for peace with everyone, with every single person, right? It says, blessed, uh, blessed be the peacemakers for they shall be called sons of God, right? So there's, there's an aspect to having a, a, a willingness and a hunger in your heart to go about making peace in any situation that the Lord recognizes and he approves it, right? We make peace. We don't, it, it, there's a, it's Proverbs 6. Uh, theolog, theologians call it a climactic verse. Uh, it's a buildup 
And when you get to like the inverse, like that's the thing the Lord is most uh, sticking his, or trying to, trying to make the point of. It's Proverbs 6. Let me get to it and read it to you. There are six things the Lord hates, seven that are an abomination to him, haughty eyes, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that make haste to run to evil, a false witness who breathes out lies, and one who sows discord among the brethren. Discord among the brethren, right? There's always going to be an element of, uh, of, of division uh, amongst the church, amongst it, not, not in it, right? Because those that are truly marked by God, those are the ones that are actually chasing and pursuing what, sh- what is peace and what is full of, right? Because how do we identify those that are for the kingdom of God? We just read it in Romans 14. It says, for the kingdom of God is not a manner of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Right, so these, these three f- fruits or realities that are within a believer is what marks us and what we can use to identify like, hey, that is my brother, right? That is, that is a like-minded, like, uh, uh, like-hearted individual that I can partner with, right? But we've begun in the church to, uh, to, to, to judge someone for their interpretation of, uh, of a secondary issue uh, and, and call them a false teacher, call them a heretic, call them a false prophet. And what that does, it sows discord, right? So, n- so now you have people that are just trying to get filled and to get raised up in the Lord that don't even know up from down, that don't even know up from down. Romans 14 speaks to, it speaks to an issue uh, that Paul's addressing, right? It, it's an issue of, of food, right? Because the Lord declared all food clean, but there was some people in their midst that didn't believe that they could partake and eat of certain foods. But Paul says that he is convinced and persuaded by the Lord that all things are good if they're to be received with praise and thanksgiving. But he says in Romans 14, 1, it says, as for the one who is weak in the faith, welcome him but not to quarrel over opinions. Not to quarrel over opinions. All we see, right, in the body of Christ, online, denominationally, is quarreling over opinions, and we're just, we're treading water in the works of heaven. We're just treading water, right? We're not, we're not going out, we're not partnering, we're not coming together, we're not communing. We don't see, we don't see Acts 2 uh, movements taking place. Why? Because we're not all together in one place with one mind and with one accord. And the, the Lord is, he, he desperately wants us to catch hold of this revelation and to partner with him in a manner that, that would alleviate the divisions amongst us. That, does that mean that we're perfectly uh, gonna agree every single time? Absolutely not. I disagree with people in the kingdom every day, but I, 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 do, I do life alongside them. I do ministry alongside them. We minister together. We pray for people together. But that doesn't mean you always have to see it perfectly the same, the same way, right? We see the same thing from different sides or from different facets right? He's a multifaceted God. Did I give you Ephesians 4, Tina? Huh? Ephesians 4, verse 3, it says, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. The unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace, right? Paul knew that this was going to be an issue. He knew that the enemy was going to come in and try to wreak havoc in the area of unity, right? So he addressed it. And he does it, he does it in a peculiar way. And, and the Lord was showing me this morning, I'm going to, thought this was uh, pretty neat. It says, there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and is in all, but grace was given to each one of us. It says, but grace was given to each one of us. And then it goes into, it goes into the apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, and evangelists. He knew that 
people, different people have diff, having different graces in the church was going to cause a point of condition, contention. So he, he made it clear. He said, these are the things that you need to stay in, right? And keep in, in, in your forefront so you stay unified, right? Even though it looks like somebody has a, a deeper measure of grace or a deeper revelation, right? There's apostles that, that walk in a deep revelation uh, of the heavens, right? And they're called to bring it to earth and, and walk in a measure of that. There's, there's prophets that walk in, I mean, just, I mean, it's, it's a beautiful facet of the Lord, right? There's evangelists that have great callings on their lives that are able to beckon people forth into the kingdom, right? These are different graces, but there's also administrations, there's helps, there's different kinds of tongues and stuff like this, right? So, so we can't, as someone in the body, look at something else and judge that thing. We can't judge it, right? Just because it's not uh, the, the thing that we're walking in, we can't sit there and judge that thing. Right, We have to decide in our heart to fight for unity in the body of Christ. We have to fight for it. Right, The enemy has spent years and years and years, centuries, right, dismantling the unity in the body of Christ. He's been dismantling it for 2,000 years. See, there's things called, there's things called salvific issues, right? Salvific issues. I think that, yeah, I think that's how you say it, salvific. It's the things relating to salvation, right? There are certain things that we cannot shift on, that, that they were hammered out in the early church, like, hey, this is what unifies us. This is what brings us together. It's Christology, right? It's the theology of, of Christ himself, right? It's the, it's the incarnation of Jesus Christ coming, right, through the Virgin Mary, right? He came, he died on the cross for our sins, and we're saved by faith alone, by grace alone, through faith alone, right? Not of your own works. You can't work your way into heaven. There are certain things in the kingdom of God that we cannot shift on, right? And when we get, when you get to a place where somebody is teaching uh, like a, a, a five-folded God, right? That's, that's a red flag. <laughs> that's, a, you know, you're, you're talking about a five-headed uh, God. No, we, we believe in a triune God, right? It's, it's the theology of triunity. It's a triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, three separate persons in one, in one Godhead, ultimately. Uh, that was hammered out in the early church, but we cannot, we cannot shift from these issues, right? But, but when, we, when we look into the church, right, and we don't see those issues, okay, we need to ask ourselves, hey, how can I how can I partner or come alongside my brother in Christ and actually further or advance the gospel? How can I further or advance the gospel? Because as long as the enemy has us quarreling inside the church, we're not making headway outside of the church. We're not making headway outside of the church, right? And and I'm not talking about the four walls. I'm talking about the body of people. We need to set it in our hearts, right? To do the kingdom's work, right? To advance the gospel, to keep pressing in, to keep pushing, but we're just, we're just treading water. As long as we're trying to pick each other apart and, and there's no peace and unity, we've got to strive for these things. We've got to strive for these things, right? There's certain verbiage used in there that he's saying it's not going to be easy. It's not going to be easy. It's going to be tough right? It's, it, it, it's going to take blood, sweat, and tears, right? It took Jesus's blood, sweat, and tears to unite people back to him. Why do we think that it's not going to cost a price? It's, it's, it's going to cost ourselves every single time, every single time. But how much do we want to see the advancement of the gospel, right? How much do we want to see every single seat filled here, praising and worshiping the Lord together, right? I'm going to turn to... Uh, Romans 15, it gives a good picture about what I was just talking about. It says in verse 5, 15, 5, May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus, that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. For the glory of God, right? We, we've, we've got to chase after harmony. We've got to chase after her. What's up, dog? Ah, <laughs> oh, scared me. It came out of nowhere. It 
that uh, verse from Galatians, Tina? Galatians 5. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed with one another. Right? Galatians 5, 14 and 15. In the same section of scriptures, it talks about the work of the flesh. And in that, it's, it has three facets of what we're talking about this morning. It's dissensions, discord, rivalries, envy, stuff like, right? And sexual immorality, idolatry, covetousness, stuff like that. But it says, for the whole law is fulfilled in one word. In one word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one, one another, right? I feel like, see, it's a, it's a fickle thing that we're talking about. It's a balance that we have to, we have to grab a hold of and we've, we have to be able to discern how, how, do we, how do we judge within the church rightly? Because we are, we are called to judge, right? But that word has a negative connotation. It always has. Right? And I believe that's the work of the enemy as well. Right? The, the, we don't judge people outside of the church. We judge within the church because there's a standard of living and righteousness that has to take place within the body of Christ. Right? It's holiness that exists within the church. Right? We are the temple of the living God. It says, be holy as he is holy. Right? So this, this standard of righteousness, we, it, we weed stuff out by identifying it and uh, ultimately how, how the Bible discern, uh, depicts it is it talks about two different natures, right? It says, we turn to 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 6, 6. Thank you. The, uh, Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness or what fellowship has light with darkness? What accord has Christ with Belial, which is Satan? Or what portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? And what agreement does the temple of God have with idols? Right, so what these, these are like four different uh, depictions of intimacy between things, right? We're called to be intimate with one another, right? It, it, the, it's fellowship, it's koinonia, Right, it's this, it's this deep intimacy that we've seen in Acts 2, right? But the Lord, is, the Lord is addressing two different natures that have to be weeded out. It has to be weeded out. And he actually, he goes as far, I'm not sure if I'm going to preach on this today, but he goes as far as expelling people from among you for living in an unrepentant state and living in sin in your midst. Right? There is, a, there is a holy and a righteous standard within the church that I believe we forfeited, right? And we have to pick it back up. But if we're going to, the Lord was showing me yesterday, he says, we've been reproaching one another for centuries, reproaching one another. We've been passing judgment uh, for the sake of judgment's sake, right? For, for, for disgracing, for shaming's sake. Uh, and just just to have the upper hand, right? It's that it's that word. If you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed with one another. But what the Lord calls us to do is reprove one another, right? There's reproach and reproof. One is condemnation, and one is speaking the truth in love for the mutual building up of one another. One comes from a wrong heart position. They, the the things might be true either way, right? You might be speaking into something that needs to leave someone's life, but if you're not doing it from a heart condition that wants to see that person redeemed unto the Lord, it's wrong, right? It's wrong every, I mean, that's why a person is going to feel condemned. Uh, where was that verse at? Uh, 2 Timothy 3.16, it says, all scripture is inspired by God, right? It, it is profitable, profitable, right? You can gain by it for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work, right? There is a righteous standard in the church and it's called the word of God, right? And the way that we wield that in the church is by 
placing in front of someone, right? Showing someone like, hey, you're, you're falling short. There's a better way and a better place uh, that you can be at. How can I help you to get there? It's, it's what Christ did for us. He came, he met us, he laid his life down so we would actually step into and walk into a place of freedom. We have to do the same thing with one another. We have to pay that same price to be able to see people redeemed unto the Lord. It's costly. It takes, it takes allowing the Lord to examine your own heart continually to be able to rightly speak into someone's heart. It's, it's not easy, right? I've, I've, I've been in situations where what I was speaking to in someone else's heart, it, was, it needed spoke into, but my heart was not correct. My heart was not right. And the, the Lord addressed that. Did, did fruit come forth? Yeah, a little bit, but there's a better way, right? There's a way that we don't actually put our brother down. We lift him up, tell him that he's, he's called to more, right? We're, we're called to more in the church, right? We're called to a standard and a degree of righteousness, right? It says that a good person cannot bear bad fruit and a bad person cannot bear good fruit. So as long as we continually judge different interpretations of the scriptures, and I'm not talking some wacky, far out stuff. I'm talking just something that you don't see uh, as, as, as the same as someone else. As long as we say that person is a false teacher, uh, a heretic, a false prophet, we actually, we sow discord in the church, right? But, but if their lives are bearing the fruit of righteousness, joy, and peace in the Holy Spirit, we have no right to sit here and judge a man's heart. We have no right to do it. Alex, will you, will you go up? I feel like the Lord, I feel like the Lord wants to heal our hearts this morning. Right, I feel like some of us have been wounded by the church. Right, continue. <laughs> We've been wounded by the church. Right, and we have these we have these preconceived notions about what it's supposed to look like. I feel like we're carrying heavy guilt. Thank you. 